Hey, good morning, everybody. It is uh, Monday, November the 30th, 2020. Welcome to the Morning Watch. Uh, today we're going to be reading uh, and unpacking together 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, before we jump in and do that, I want to give a couple minutes for some folks to get on here. Um, it's a, it's going to be a, a weird weather day, right, here in Kentucky today. Um, we're going to have some some rain and we're going to have some cold temps. Um, we're going to have maybe even some snow. It's kind of, you know, um, but it's that time of year. I guess we need to kind of expect it, right? Morning, Allison and Kim. So excited you guys are here. So let's go ahead and open up with a word of prayer and then we will, we'll get rolling. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this morning. I just, I'm thankful that you have given us life, that you have uh, that you continue to sustain us in everything, uh, every hill and valley and every uh, mountaintop moment and every every uh, valley moment that we that we face. Well, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that we can that we can gather together and and study uh, your word together and um, understand it and uh, let it transform our lives. We're just thankful for that. Lord, be with us, be with all of our families, be with the sick, Lord, those that are struggling with this virus and other health issues, Lord, we just want to lift them up to you. Lord, the lost, people that we know that don't know you as their Lord and Savior, though we pray that you would um, do what it takes, Lord, to bring them home. I pray, Lord, if um, if you want to use us to do that, then, Lord, we're, we're willing and available and ready to do that. Um, Lord, give us those opportunities today. Lord, we love you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, there's Kim and David Earl and my sister and my mom. All right, let's, let's read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and then we'll unpack it a little bit. Okay, so Paul writes to the Thessalonians in verse 1. He says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God, to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of such conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext of greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become our very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we, while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct towards you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it what it really was, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displease God and oppose all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But God's wrath has come upon them at last. But since we were torn away from you, brothers, for a short time, in person, not in heart, we endeavored the more eagerly and with great desire to see you face to face, because I wanted to come to you, I, Paul, again and again, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting before our Lord Jesus at his coming? Is it not you? 
for you are our glory and joy. Morning, Josh and, and Billy. <laughs> Excuse me. I am getting a cold or something. I've been taking my medicine and do nasty. All right. So let's see what Paul is trying to say here. We hear, we hear so clearly in Paul's words, a sincere and deep love and concern for the church in Thessalonica. Um, and Paul, through that, really shares with him, shares with us, um, a strategy for evangelism. You hear that. You hear these things, these these strategies, these ideas emerge. Paul, Paul tells us in verse 2, he says, For though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of such conflict. So Paul tells, he's reminding the church at Thessalonica and us that through his ministry, he has endured great persecution. Okay? Now, you and I as believers are going to face persecution. We are going to face difficulties. Okay? So Paul gives us that that uh, that upfront understanding of what's going to happen. I love this. Look at verse four. He says, "But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God, who tests our hearts." How often times do we make decisions in life and um, do what we do because it's going to make other people happy? their perception of us, their opinion of us. What Paul is saying here, he said, everything that I have done, the single-minded focus around the gospel, which we should have, we should have that same laser-like intensity and focus around the gospel that Paul does. The gospel is not one room in Paul's spiritual house. It is the whole house. That is, the, that is a wonderful model for us to be aware of too. Paul says, I don't do what I do to please man and to get man's kudos and accolades. I do it in order to please the Lord. Okay. He says, and I love this too, but to please God who tests our hearts. God is in the business of testing our hearts to see where we stand. Salvation is a very personal thing. And the only one who really knows if you are really saved is the Lord himself and you, right? But we can know. So that's a big thing. Paul says, I didn't come and do the work that I'm doing here for any kind of flattery or any kind of, of, uh, of recognition. He says in verse 5, For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor the pretext of greed. God is our witness. Nor do we seek, verse 6, glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Okay? So he says very clearly, I, we came in a way that was as humble as possible. Because we know that it's not about us. Sharing the gospel with someone, there's nothing that I ever did to get myself saved. God does the pursuing. He runs us down and chooses us and pursues us. And goes after us. If you're a Christian this morning, you have been pursued by the Lord. And so he says that here. Okay. He also, we hear him talk in two different occasions in chapter 2, comparing his love and concern and how he handled them. He didn't want to be a burden to them. He didn't want to be a burden or exact any kind of, of difficulty in the, on the lives of the church or the people of Thessalonica. And so he tells them here, he says, uh, verse 7, But we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. A mom taking care of her kids. Very, very intimate and very close. He says in verse 8, So being affectionately desirous of you, we're ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our very our own selves. What does that mean? Well, when you're discipling somebody, and we as believers are, you know, in the Great Commission, Jesus told us to go into all the world and make disciples. A disciple is a follower of Jesus who aligns his or her life with him. So being a disciple maker, okay, being a disciple maker 
is a relationship exercise where we step alongside somebody and we invest in them spiritually, pouring into them, teaching them everything that I have commanded you, the Bible says. But here he says here, he says part of that, he says it's not just the gospel, even though that's the number one thing. He says, but also our own lives. It's pouring your life into the life of another person. If you're a believer today, you are, you have someone, someone has had a big influence on that. Another person, maybe your mom or dad, or maybe your pastor, or somebody has discipled you. My question to you this morning, to me, is who are you discipling? Who is that person that you do life with, that you are discipling? We always should be discipling somebody. We should always be working to reproduce ourselves as believers. But we don't just make disciples. We also make disciples who understand that their responsibility is to make disciples. Okay? It's this reproduction thing. So, he says, you share not just the gospel, but ourselves. And then he goes on in verse <clears throat> in verse 11. He says, For you know how like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his kingdom, his own kingdom and glory. Again, now he's comparing his work to a dad. Again, very. He loved these people. You can see that. You can hear that in his words. And he says, and then 13, he says, well, we also thank God constantly for this. He says that you receive the word of God. He said, it's, that's what it is. He said, it's not the words of man, it's the words of God. And he says, for you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus and are in Judea. Churches supporting each other, modeling their work after one another. And he says here, he says, Verse uh, 16, by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved, so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But God's wrath has come upon them at last. So strong. Verse 17 through the rest of the verse, Paul says, I have tried again and again to come to you, but I've been hindered. Satan has hindered me from coming. And he says, for you are our glory and joy. It grieves him. It grieves Paul that he cannot be with them. He cannot be with the church at Thessalonica because he's been hindered. But he wants to be. He loves these people. You hear a pastor's heart, a minister's heart who wants to be with his people. And so those are the big things that we see out of today. Um, my question to you this morning is, as we, as we think about this chapter a little bit on a deeper level, you hear following Jesus, we hear this from Paul in this chapter, it is, it is costly. Okay, it is costly. It cost us a lot, um, and it should. Okay, um, you know, grace is not cheap, because Jesus Himself died in order to extend to us the grace and mercy that we find in what He did on the cross. The question that I have for myself and for you this morning is what does it what what does it cost you to follow Jesus? Being a follower of Jesus should be should force us to the edge to live in a way that is different. Paul says, I've endured great persecution because I follow Jesus. What are we doing? What's it cost us? It cost Jesus his own life. Okay? And we identify with Christ in his death and burial and resurrection. Discipleship is costly. Okay? It is. It's not a cheap grace. Jesus paid his own life. What does the Bible say? He says, my life is not my own. That it was bought with a price. And the price of that was the life of, of, of our Lord Jesus on the cross. So, that's what we hear. That's what we hear from Paul this morning. Um, tomorrow we're going to be in chapter 3 and so by the end of the week we will have moved over into 2 Thessalonians um, my plan right now um, <clears throat> unless you want to keep going and we, we definitely can do that is to finish up Paul's letters and then just see what happens
if you guys want to continue in the New Testament, we can go back and do the Gospels. We can do Hebrews. Um, Revelation scares me a little bit. I don't know that I am equipped uh, or um, smart enough to do Revelation. But um, after we finish Paul's letters, then if you all want to continue, then we will, then we will do that. Okay. I love you all. Have a great Monday. It's Monday, um, but it's going to be a snowy, nasty Monday. But you know, God is good. He's on his throne, and uh, we're blessed. So let's pray together. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for your word. Be with us and guide us in all that we do. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Y'all be blessed. Have a wonderful Monday, and we will see you tomorrow.